This is a continuation of reading Mori Nivokim, the guide for the perplexed. Um, due to some concerns about the first video, uh, I did get rabbinic approval for the series, and the videos continue to be monitored by a rabbi from Israel. And if you want the name of the rabbi who is monitoring my videos, just write me. Okay, so continuing. Image and likeness. People have thought that in the Hebrew language, image denotes the shape and configuration of a thing. This supposition led them to the pure doctrine of the corporeality of God, on account of his saying, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. For they thought that God has a man's form, I mean his shape and configuration. The pure doctrine of the corporeality of God was a necessary consequence to be accepted by them. They accordingly believed in it, and deemed that if they abandoned this belief, they would be, they would give the lie to the biblical text, that they would even make the deity to be nothing at all unless it, they thought that God were a body, provided with a face and a hand, it like them in shape and configuration. However, he is, in their view, bigger and more resplendent than they themselves, and the matter of which he is composed is not flesh and blood. As they see it, this is as far as one can go in establishing the separateness of God from other things. Now with respect to that which ought to be said in order to refute the doctrine of the corporeality of God, and to establish his real unity, which can have no true reality unless one disproves his corporeality, you shall know the demonstration of all this from this treatise. However, here in this chapter, only an indication is given with a view to elucidating the meaning of image and likeness. Now I say that in the Hebrew language the proper term designating the form that is well known among the multitude, that is, namely, that form which is the shaping configuration of a thing, is to'ar. Thus, Scripture says, beautiful in form and beautiful in appearance. What form is he of, and the f for, as the form of the children of a king? This term also applied to is also applied to an artificial form. Thus he maketh its form with a line, and he maketh he marketh its form with a compass. Those terms are never applied to the deity, may he be exalted. Far and remote may his thought may this thought be from us. The term image, on the other hand, is applied to the natural form, I mean to the notion and virtue of which a thing is constituted as a substance and becomes what it is. It is the true reality of the thing in so far as the latter is that particular being. In man that notion is that is that from which human apprehension derives. It is on this account of of this intellectual apprehension that it is said of man in the image of God created he him. For this reason also it is said thou contemptest their image for contempt has for its object the soul which ha is the specific form not the shape and configuration of the parts of the body i assert also that the reason why idols are called images lies in the fact that what was sought in them was the notion that was deemed to subsist in them and not their shape and configuration i assert similarly with regard to the scriptural expression image of your emirates for what was intended by them was not the notion of warding off the harm caused by the emeralds, and not the shape of the emeralds. If, however, there should be no, if, however, there should be no doubt concerning the expressions images of your emeralds and images being used in order to denote shape and configuration, it would follow that image is an, is an unequivocal or amphibolous term applied to the specific form, and also to the artificial form, and to what is analogous to the two in the sh shapes and configurations of the natural bodies. That which was meant in the scriptural dictum, let us make man in our image, was the specific form, which is intellectual apprehension, not the shape and configuration. We have explained to you the difference between image and form, and have explained the meaning of image. As for the term likeness, it is a noun derived from the verb demo to be like, and signifies likeness in respect to, of a notion. For the scriptural dictum, 
I am like a pelican in the wilderness does not signify that the author resembled a pelican with regard to its wings and feathers, but that his sadness was like that of the bird. In the same way in the verse, nor was any tree in the garden like unto it in beauty. The likeness is respect to the notion of beauty. Similarly, the verses, their venom is the likeness of the venom of a serpent, his likeness that is that of a lion that is eager to tear into pieces, refer both of them to the likeness in respect of a notion and not with respect to a shape and configuration. In the same way, it is said the likeness of the throne, the likeness of a throne, the likeness being the likeness referred to being in respect to of elevation and sublimity, not in respect of a throne, square, shape, its solidity, and the strength of its legs, as wretched people think. A similar explanation can also be applied to the expression, the likeness of the living creatures. Now men possess the, his proprium, something like something in him that is very strange, is not, and is as it is not found in anything else that exists under the sphere of the moon, namely intellectual apprehension. In the exercise of this, no sense, no part of the body, none of the extremities are used, and therefore this apprehension was likened unto the apprehension of the deity, which does not require an instrument, although in reality it is not like the latter apprehension, but only appears so to the first stirrings of opinion. It was because of this something, I mean because of this divine intellect conjoined with man, that it is said of the latter that he is in the image of God and in his likeness, not that God, may he be exalted, is a body and possesses a shape.